Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. We're back with the stories for this week. I've also got some quick announcements before we get started. Security, submit your B-Sides Tampa CFP. They will be a cruise, which will stop in Cozumel, New Mexico. Link is in the show notes. <laughs> Larry is teaching Security 617 Wireless Ethical Hacking, Penetration Testing, and Defense at the Pentest Hack Fest Summit in Alexandria, Virginia. Make sure you check out Larry Sands' instructor page for all the upcoming course offerings. All those links are also in the show notes. Sign the petition for EFF to stand up for stronger security in the show notes as well. Um, that's all I had for announcements. Mike, you got some stories in there. I got I tried. I tried to show up this week, man. You and did. I picked a good week to actually you put rep- some stories in. You did because we really needed you this week. Our, our listeners, thank you. Um, I do have a story in there about how to become a pen tester, and I I think that uh, the article can be summarized by a quote by H. D. Moore that says, "If you don't think you're a noob, you're not trying hard enough." I think that hmm. really summarizes. A lot of things, certainly. Um, so I thought it was a good article. It talks about uh, a lot of things about how to become a pen tester, defining goals for yourself, um, you know, how you learn as you go throughout your career. Um, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize that not all of us start out as being an, an expert exploit writer uh, when you're a penetration tester. You know, it, it's certainly something you can learn. Or maybe you're an exploit writer and you want to become a penetration tester. I don't want to say the two are mutually exclusive. They can be mutually exclusive, right? Um, and it is a skill that I think uh, is applicable to penetration testing. Um, I also think it's one you uh, can certainly learn as you're doing penetration testing as well. Not every client is looking for you to write customized uh, exploits. Uh, certainly, you have to know how to use exploits and tune and customize exploits. Um, so I want to make that point. The article touches on that briefly. Um, you know they talk now this about, this is pen testing right not security researching yeah yeah <laughs> it is a part of it is part of pen testing though but um they also talk about the right way to ask a question which i thought was great you know you should obviously do some research before you ask a question um i don't know about you mike but when i first started in it the people that taught me and program programming in it um i learned in my first job while I was still in college and the people i worked with all pretty much had the same rule I, and a lot of times it, it would either start with a question or it would start with a problem. But they would say, if you get stuck, spend a maximum of 20 or 30 minutes on it before you come ask me a question. Don't default to just come in and ask me a question. Struggle with it first. Then come to me with the question and what you did to struggle with it. And then we might give you the answer. I was like from the school of hard knocks, man. I don't know. The people I just read an article. T- I, I read an article today mm-hmm. uh, about learning, and it said that true learning is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Get over it, okay, and good. that you might have to read a book twice, or that if you're reading and trying to make the connections, yeah, it takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your brain fires in a lot of different ways. I used to have a rule uh, with my teams: I will answer any question you ask me one time. Yes. But I won't answer it twice, and I, and I'm not going to spoon feed you. So if you come to me with a problem, that's cool. I'm here for you, and I'll help you with mindset, thought process, actual whatever. But don't just come and say, "Yep, I got a problem." Teach a man to fish. With a, well, yeah, I mean, I come guess with more a, politically correct. Idea teach a person solution. to fish. I should say. Yeah, I felt very uncomfortable when you said "man to fish." Sorry, just so we're clear. Sorry for that. No, I mean, I I think this is good when it talks about asking questions. You know, um, there's there are there's some value to asking ambiguous questions uh, to. 
you know, use the follow-ups because, you know, it's like the, the rule of five whys and stuff. But no, I, I think, I think this is, this is good stuff, but let me ask this one question again, too. I, I, I'm becoming more interested in understanding the definitions. So if somebody says they're a pen tester, what does that mean? Well, just like, I think in answer to a lot of your questions, Mike, it depends. <laughs> 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 now you see why I ask the questions I ask. Yeah. No, I well, and the reason I say that to a lot of things is there's different types of pen testers, right? Just like there's different types okay. of threat intelligence, there's different types of vulnerability. I mean, the the list goes on, right? I mean, you have to put it in context. So there's different types of penetration tests and penetration testers, and you should marry the two. Um, so is this a, good general advice? Is this good blanket advice you want to be – in the field of pen testing, yes, yeah, this will I, help. I, yes, but then yes. you have to build your specific niche and specialty on top of this. And you could have multiple specialties. I, see, I know a lot of pen testers have multiple specialties. You know, one person is a crypto expert. One person is a networking expert. And a lot of those people who are experts in one area also are proficient in the other areas. But you can, you know, kind of pick an area of specialty. But that doesn't give you like a pass to like not be proficient in the other areas or learn about the other areas. You can't be afraid to learn about the other areas when you're a pen tester because you're going to get called upon to do things that are outside of your area of comfort and you should welcome those things. And that takes me straight back to H.G. Moore's comment, right? Yep. Like yep. you should feel like a noob all the time. So it, taking on new challenges, I think it's part of anything with life in general, to not to get too philosophical, right? But it's a big part of pen testing. And because a penetration test could lead you to an area that maybe you're not all that proficient in and you got to go figure it out. So I think the advice that I would have if I were to write this article is to not be afraid of new challenges if you want to be a pen tester and not be afraid to learn on your own. So then flip that around, right? If, if you possess an intellectual, almost insatiable curiosity, mm -hmm. you might be a good pen tester. That's the most important thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, not I mean, look, Einstein said, the more I know, the more I know I don't know. Exactly. But that's always been one of my favorite, yep. one of my favorite quotes. There's always something to learn. Every opportunity has something to teach you. You're right. If you walk through that door, like you're the biggest, baddest gun in the West, you might be caught off guard. I do want to go back to one point. Uh, and, you know, people say, well, the only, you know, stupid question is the one you don't ask. Um, and, you know, oh, people on the Internet don't know how to ask a question. They're just looking for a shortcut. But sometimes, in my experience anyway, and I'm like, I don't know if you've experienced this as well. Sometimes you just don't know how to ask a question. And you yeah. can't you can't figure out how to do the research because you don't know how to ask a question. Like, I don't know enough about this topic to even know where to start looking. And I have looked, but I can't figure out, like, the basic building blocks. And that's where you have to turn to someone who's a mentor to say, well, you know, I want to learn about this type of password cracking. But, like, I don't, where do I – can you just point me in the right direction? And that's yeah, but totally I, cool. No, that's totally cool. I'm, right? I'm with you on that. But the, the key to that is then don't take the Twitter and every other social media network and, mm -hmm. and push that out there because you're setting yourself up for a series of attacks on that type of stuff. Absolutely. No, I, you know, I it, have, But I guess my point is having a mentor is important. Having friends, right. colleagues that you can approach with that, not in a social media context like you said, Mike, but that's having right. – you know, someone to do that. Um, yeah, and the framing is important, with. right? There's a big difference between saying, I don't know how to do this, and hey, I'm banging my head against this. I I've tried to think of different ways to look for it. I've looked for stuff online. I, I can't figure it out. What would you look for, or how do you right. solve it? It is a very different approach than, I don't get it. It doesn't work. Screw this, which we unfortunately see people, they, they give up easy. But, you know, there's a flip side to this, too. There's a distinction between knowing something and knowing how to approach something. I put a lot more value on the second than the first. You can Google a lot of facts and information. Mm -hmm. If you have great recall, good for you. It's impressive. Uh, but knowing how to think about something, how to break it down, how to ask. I mean, that's why I spend so much time figuring out how to ask questions. Yeah. And, and people always laugh my question. Oh, they're easy. And I go, cool, answer it. Well, I mean, it's it's not okay. It's kind of nuanced. Well, I mean, it's kind of complicated. Well, okay, right. That's why I asked the question. The smartest people I know will ask me questions, and they're like way smarter than me. So instantly, that's why they're smarter than me because they know how to ask questions, right? But they'll ask me questions about how would I solve the problem, right? Yep. Not what the answer is necessarily, but how I would solve the problem, so they can go try that approach on their own. 
Um, I, Josh Wright is a prime example of that, right? Like when Josh asks you a question, um, it's always about, well, you know, like what would your approach be to solve that problem? Or what do you think about this approach to solving the problem kind of thing? Uh, he's someone that comes to mind. Ed Scotus is known, and they happen to work for the same company now, right? Extremely, extremely brilliant individuals, and they know how to ask a question. So take uh, that back to the last segment. When you're working with people in the business, and you get a chance. Don't don't tell them the answer. You know, we we get hung up in security. We want to be right. And and I appreciate it. It's a, it's a fairly human thing. It's so liberating the day you can say, I don't know. But there's a big distinction between I don't know and walking away mm -hmm. and saying, you know, I don't have a quick answer to that, but I know how to get one. Right. Let's go figure it out. But but what you just said is even more important, I think. Well, how would you approach it? Mm -hmm. What do you think? And I find there are so many other fields from which we can draw on. And you look at it like, whoa, hold on. I got to write that down. That's awesome. If we don't ask the questions and we don't engage in those conversations, if we think we know it, then, then we don't get there. Mm -hmm. And I, that, this obviously crosses past pen testing. That's, that's pretty good career advice for anybody. Absolutely. Mike, let's talk about some of your stories. Well, I was just going to ask you, um, how do you feel about turning your car into a connected device? The security person in me says, hell no. Yeah, right. Um, but the inner nerd in me, or outer nerd, I should say, um, wants my devices to be connected, right? This is the internal struggle that I have when I apply this to my home automation system. I really want all this connectivity and all these great features, right? When I find light bulbs on sale for 50% off, yeah, I want to buy them. I want to install them and configure them because I want to be able to control my lights from my smartphone. That's important to me. But the security risks are certainly something we need to weigh weigh in on that decision. And sometimes, I don't know, I feel like I throw caution to the wind as a security professional when I'm playing around with my own home automation system. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the stories I threw up is that there's, there's yet another uh, group jumping into the mix to say, here, uh, 200 bucks, you can plug this into your OBD obd2 port mm -hmm. and uh and now you you've got a connected car and we see where the insurance companies are getting into it now we see where uh, verizon got into it i forgot what their offering is called and and the question what i keep verizon's, looking at what is verizon's play there i have to go look at uh they sell you the data it's a data connection thing mm -hmm. so it's oh, it's, so it's you connecting can, you can have a wi-fi hotspot in your car I didn't see that. I didn't see that as an offering, but maybe it is. But but it's it's the telemetry doesn't rely necessarily on wireless. Mm -hmm. And I, to my to my guess, without looking at it, that that's a play into connected cars. That stuff right. came out right after the stunt hacking happened, and I I just kind of shook my head and I went, did did nobody look at the timing of this? Mm. I mean, I just you know, I mean, that's the thing I kind of find it interesting. I mean, we're we're at a place in the industry where on one hand we're saying auto manufacturers are not getting this right. Stuff we already talked about, right? Segmentation and, and compartmentalization. But oh, by the way, let's use this port that was never designed to be connected to the internet. Kind of like, I don't know, SCADA systems that shouldn't be connected to the internet. And let's connect it to the internet. And, you know, but nothing will go wrong with it. So, you know, the thing, here's the thing I find interesting with this. I think it's fascinating. I'm just skeptical enough. And, uh, and you know, I, I remember the days when my grandfather taught me how to replace a freaking carburetor, right? Stuff we don't even really have on, on cars anymore unless you have a, an older car. Uh, I liked being able to work on cars. Today's cars, you got to bring them into the shop. So I can see there's – look, I, I get the appeal. I, I get the interest in it. It's not something that I'm terribly excited about personally. But the questions that I have then is uh, now that I'm starting to work with more startups – and I always ask them, this is why I ask you questions, Paul, about firmware. And, and what are the three questions you would ask? At some point, did somebody say, what if somebody got control of this? What could right. they do? What excites me, though, Mike, is when we enable these smart cars, I feel like we're that much closer to having flying cars. I don't know. Maybe the that's Jetsons. just me. Yeah. Or even in Back to the Future. I mean, future. now I, that I we're keep yeah, going back to, back to the back future, to the right? Future. We got to go yeah. to the Jetsons. Now we got to go further out. We, yeah. No, I mean, I just, I, I think it's interesting. It, you know, it, it's one of those things um, that just kind of comes up. Here's one I do want to talk about. The, the oh, wait, one more thing. I'm back to the future. Great meme that I saw in that. Marty, you have to come to the future. The Patriots are 5-0 and oh, and Brady's kicking everyone's ass. <laughs> I have to throw that in there every once in a while. No, it's fair enough. 
Um, by the way, and there's a lot the, of people that want to throw things at me right now. I'm how, sure. how are my Panthers doing? That's all I'm going to say for now. Oh, they're not we're doing up. well. Start. They're not doing well this year, are they? No, we're we're having a freaking awesome start. So we'll see how that that plays out. I saw this headline today. I mm-hmm. want to see your reaction to it because because mine was kind of like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And and this is we foreshadowed this in our talk before about security as a process. So the Office of uh, Management and Budget (OMB). Uh, is they they're doing their cyber sprint follow up. So they uh, after all the problems uh, this summer uh, with uh, the, all the, the leaks and the breaches and everything else, they did a sprint and they looked to find and, and address as many gaps as possible. And now they're patting themselves on the back. Look at us, good job. And, and I looked at it and I went, oh, that's not how security works. Oh yeah, I mean you're teeing it up for me, Mike. It's not a sprint; it's a marathon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that's that's a real that's a real sh- crappy analogy. No, I mean I, I but, well, I mean it, it's an analogy that we use a lot. I, I think that the the point that makes me more concerned about it is that we see people do it all the time. Well, I I looked quick. I I found the vulnerabilities, and there's my gaps, and and I go fix it. You know, mm-hmm. and and I. Look, shameless plug, um, I've got two of my own stories in the news for this week, so we, we need not talk much about them, but I'll leave it with this. That's not showing any leadership. We think it is. But when you talk about gaps, what that means is these are failures. So there's no discussion of the world is changing, the attack vectors are changing, our environment is changing, and we need to change with it. It's, it's a gap. And when you look at a traditional gap analysis – What it says is uh, where you misappropriated and misaligned your resources and opportunities. So if you're going to keep talking about gaps, what you're saying to the officers and the directors is, I can't be trusted to allocate stuff properly. So my advice, if you want to be a leader, stop talking about that. But more importantly, this isn't something you, you, okay, we did it for 30 days, we're good. Pat yourselves on the back and go home. I just, Michael, I want to talk about leaders. I want to talk about the leader of the CIA. Director of the CIA, John Use Brennan. Hop- <laughs> you're laughing hop- already. Well. I haven't even said what it is, and you're laughing already because you probably saw this on the news as well as I, right? Did you miss it? Yeah. It, he was using an AOL email account that apparently people hacked into and stole information about what he was advising the then president on at the time. Why is that? The whole, all these things about the story just don't make sense to me. Well, and let's be fair. Uh, so, so first, I want to say I I think it's I think it's a, a a a bad thing in our industry when we pick on the victim, and in this case, he's the victim. I think victim shaming in most circumstances is bad, unless, of course, you're the freaking director of the CIA and you're conducting official business. On anybody's account, I mean, Hillary Clinton is in the email is in the spotlight constantly over the email server. We've had yep. countless debates over it, and and certainly not for us to litigate today. But I still shaking my head at that. So, you, I mean, first of all, let, let's this kid, the the set of stones on this kid. <laughs> he's, he has to be like he's, I'm uh, in a hacker in the CIA <laughs> director's email account, and they they pose as a Verizon employee. And supposedly yeah. got information that led them to accessing the A. I mean, we've seen Doesn't a lot of- Doesn't he watch the movies? The black bag is coming out for his head, man. Well, He's we've talked about black. a lot of stories on the show in the past, Michael, about how uh, Sarah Palin and a lot of these other celebrities, um, the famous one on our show, right, was Paris Hilton. We talked about that for a while. The recent breach of everyone's naked pictures that was released all came down to people getting personal information and using the password reset feature to get access to their email. And we kind of, I, I like your analogy, like we gave them a pass, right? Because, well, no one really knows what Paris Hilton did or does, but <laughs> they're Just not the directors of the CIA. Right? I mean, yeah, I mean, look, I, it, it's, I, I don't like the victim shaming to it, but what's, what is interesting here, I mean, again, I, conducting official business over an unclassified network when you're provided an appropriate network and you're the director of the CIA. Now, keep in mind, right, the director of the CIA is an appointed position, uh, which means it, it, it happens to be highly political, which means the, the tradecraft and spycraft and everything else that we would associate with the CIA may not necessarily be associated with him. But but the, here's the part that I think is more interesting is that the the kid who, quote, hacked him, right, the, the guy who perpetrated mm-hmm. this said, well, 
I actually kind of pulled information from his SF-86, and that's part of the stuff that was what was released with the, the hack or the attack yep. on the Office of, of Personnel Management. And so just so we're clear, when everybody's, well, I mean, we're not sure what the damage is. Well, so a, a, a freaking high school kid was able to take information from that, impersonate a Verizon worker. Yeah, I get it. He broke laws and he's got big stones. But so what? So he did that, and using that information, he got access to this guy's account and all sorts of other stuff. And didn't he just say? I mean, he basically taunting everybody now and said, "Oh, I'm going after." I forgot who he said. Who he say? He's going after the FBI next. Somebody. He's but he's got a list. Yep. That's um. What this tells us is we need to ask better questions about the what ifs, you know. And and it goes back to my earlier point on awareness. Just because we tell people not to do something, like we, it's like, oh, I told them not to do that, but they did it, so they must be stupid. Please don't suggest to me that the director of the CIA is stupid. It, he he didn't take the threat seriously. He didn't understand how the technology worked, and nobody translated it in a way that that he that basically said you you realize what you're essentially doing is sending information by postcard and counting on uh, nobody at the post office to read it and, and nobody at the post office to you know give out your information it, it's Which one of, it's one of the most did. shocking breaches if you will i don't know if you call this a breach but it's one of the most shocking breaches for me so far this year by far without a doubt it's it's absolutely fascinating and what it tells you is that there's a there's a level of sophistication. I mean, look, you know, on, on one hand, when people ask me about, and, and I, I don't like labels, I, I, I appreciate our human need to categorize people but when we say, well, the millennial generation. I think you and I are technically part of what, Gen X? Uh, at least I, I think I am based on where the dates are cut off. I, I don't know what that means. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to act or who I'm supposed to associate with. Um, I've seen people try to pretend now that, well, millennials, a state of mind. Yeah, great. Good for you. Here, here's the thing though. One of the things that we know is that just because you're a so-called digital native and you've grown up with the technology, it doesn't mean you understand the implications of it. And that's where we have this really great opportunity. I saw a fun thing on Facebook yesterday about building daycare centers and nursing homes and letting the generations interact. Yeah, we need more of that. So, so what I take away from the story really kind of fascinating is we have people that are clever at any age and that have brazen interest in finding out what they can do. I mean, I got to tell you, as a high school kid, the thought of impersonating somebody else for a major telco company to, to see if I could get access to the CIA director's email, uh, I, yeah. let me be candid. I'm not going to do it now. Right. I wouldn't right. have done it then. But if the kid's doing it and then going to the newspapers about it and bragging about it, that's um, – okay, oh, well, so what are our attackers willing to do? It, to so along those lines, Mike, I wanted to talk about a Brian Krebs article, uh, Don't Be Fooled by Fake Online Reviews. I, I have to say, as someone who relies pretty heavily on online reviews, right, we, yeah. have, we have a lot of equipment that runs this podcast, right, and we are constantly – it, it just to make the to put it in perspective, there's at least ten computers that we have to maintain to make the show happen, right? So I mean, we're we're a pretty big uh, consumer. You're a big deal. I got it, bro. No, we're not a big deal. Big we're, in Japan. We're a big consumer of technology and figuring out which technology we should buy and, and reading reviews. And there's apparently a lot of um, shenanigans going on with these reviews, right? People that. Um, and Amazon is, cr is trying to crack down on this, but they're trying to, of course, get paid to do positive reviews for a product they've never used, right? The other thing that was interesting in part two of this article was um, Brian Krebs was talking about a scheme where if you're in the service industry, let's say you do windshields, garage doors, something where you have to come out to the home and repair something or replace something, that you can pay a company for leads. Mike, you and I are into a lead generation, right? So what these companies do is they create 50 different companies on the internet, fake companies that do garage door repair. And they get a lot of Google SEO across those 50 companies. They take the leads that come in for those companies and they feed them to real people who fix garage doors. And that is coming under some scrutiny now, according to the Krebs article, which I thought was interesting. Anytime you have complexity... People will look for ways to subvert the system. I, it, Google SEO wins, man. When you Google for garage door repair in your area, right? You, 
most people assume that whoever comes up first must be the one that I want to use because they have the highest Google SEO and that weighs heavily. Like you said, in this generation now, uh, <clears throat> most of us are in tune with Google SEO. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, for my own behavior, I don't always look at the top one, but to think about it, I'm not sure how often I click through past maybe two pages. Yeah. If you're not in the first page or two, it's probably not worth it. Locally, we did go to Angie's list. I pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think at least on like an Amazon Sometimes you read a review and you're like, did you did you even try it? And other times, you know, you can tell some reviews are written really well. Um, I think there's a, a level of skepticism that most of us should apply. But to I, the I think positive it's kind of reviews, right? What I do on Amazon is I read the negative reviews. That's what I do too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, anytime somebody's like, well, it was shipped a day late, so I gave yeah. one star. I it mean, was, I love the oh, product. It, it was DOA. Like, it was DOA. One star. Well, right. you know, I, I, I smoke cigars. They're a handmade product. A lot of the technology we get is there's a certain degree of error, right? Of course, some things are going to be DOA, right? Now, if there's, if there's 15 reviews and eight of them are, I got this and it was DOA, well, then I'm like, okay, that's skeptical. But if it's a four-star review and it's four stars because there's a few out of the 800 reviews that I got at DOA, then I'm like, okay, that's probably, you know, now, there's, there's, there's two interesting things on this, too. One of the things I look at is the more money I'm going to commit to a purchase, the more time I'll spend mm. thinking about it and looking at those reviews. But the other thing I find, too, is you know if we look at the buying habits, like B2B buying habits, the number one thing is still uh, interaction, personal interaction. The number two is re referral from friend. And I think about that. I mean, most of us, if you need a plumber, you need, you know, you, I, I had a friend needed a windshield replaced. I hadn't had experience. I called another friend. Said, oh, I worked with this company. They're mm -hmm. great. Go there. So we, we still do a lot of that. I think it's interesting. Social media um, is good for that too. It's, it's definitely for big getting that, right? uh, Big purchases. I mean, you put it out there on Twitter. Facebook. Well, so this is a story I, I threw up. Uh, and and uh, the throw up's not a pun yet. But uh, here's the headline. Majority of online shoppers afraid of being hacked while buying online. 70% of respondents said they worry about their security when they're using public Wi-Fi, which I, 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 I'm sorry, what? Uh, and then 73% fear having their identity stolen when they're using their personal banking websites. Uh, but then they, you know, more than 50% didn't check for a, an icon. Look, it, it didn't have the questions in it. Let me start with this. Anytime somebody sends me one of these things, and, and they want to use this as a shock claim, right? 70% are concerned. We've got to do something about it. I would say, what, the, what was the question? If the question is, you're concerned when you use something that's online and public, right? Of course, 70% are going to say yes. Yeah, right. So the way they ask the question is kind of important. But what I, what I thought here, at least in terms of the headline, is the majority of shoppers are afraid of being hacked. And then you go into it and they're worried about their identity. Well, I almost feel like sometimes we've done a disservice by suggesting that there's – by not being more detailed on the distinction between credit card fraud where you have zero liability mm -hmm. and actual identity theft. What do you think? Are, are, no, do we need to do a better exactly job what I was thinking. Stuff? That was exactly what I was thinking when you were describing that story. I'm like, okay, so I'm putting my credit card information online and that might get hacked. And again, my liability for that is pretty much zero, right? It might depend on my credit card company. It might depend on whether I have a debit card or credit card. But debit cards are almost all zero now as well. The only oh, thing really? you're going to so be does that change over. The, I've always been a huge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's free market competition, um, and and it depends now too whether you use your debit card as a debit card or you use your debit card as a credit card. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the most part, I I I'm sure someone will will happily prove me wrong. But almost all of the banks that I'm aware of and credit unions. Your 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 liability is zero uh, on any term uh, any of the payment cards that that we have well, available. To what I don't like about the debit card is if it gets hacked, the money comes out of my account. Out of your gone. account, it's gone. Thanks right. for paying. Bye. Yeah, yep. that's what I don't like about it. In any case, I I don't see the the lines between credit card fraud and identity theft. Right, those are two different things that I think we might have sounded the alarm a little too hard about the internet being an insecure place and telling people about, well, credit card fraud is one thing and identity theft is another thing. And that's something that, you, you know, you educate your spouse. About. If you're in security, you educate your spouse about OPSEC, yeah. right? And if you've done it right, 
Credit cards, yeah, they're going to question that. Is this website safe? I want to buy this thing. Is this website safe? Is the question I get from, from my wife. Um, whenever it turns to a bank account, a social security number, other PII, I get the question immediately like, whoa, should I be doing – not even is this website safe. Like, should I be doing this at all? You know? Because they're two so different go- things. It's a different risk level. Absolutely. And, that, and that's where – if you want to do awareness in your organization on a shoestring budget, have that conversation. Mm-hmm. Do a lunch and learn. And don't have all the answers. Just go show up and talk. Talk about your thought process. How do you decide? How do you take a look at it? But since you, <laughs> it's, so, funny, but since it's we, funny, Mike, when you talk about user awareness in that context, people get really interested because it's not about protecting the organization they work for at that point. It's about protecting themselves. So instantly their awareness is heightened about, oh, I want to learn well, about this. And, right? and, and, and the secret to it, and I'll give one more secret out, at least that I've used it for years. This one's not so much of a secret anymore, but but the, the processes are the same. All it shifts is the context. If I show you how to do what you're doing at home better, you can apply the same principles in the thought process at work. And that's why I, I really, I'm becoming a much bigger fan of, of educating people on thought process and sharing thought process. In fact, I don't teach thought process. I only share mine and, and uh, you know, unless it's on stuff that I've studied, right? Leadership communication, I've studied deeply, but other things, not so much. But, but here's the other trick too. I always see people say, well, how do I teach my kid about social media? Uh, don't have them teach you. Mm. Start with you. Have them ask what what they can figure out about you. In fact, I, we should. If we if you haven't done an interview on on uh, OSINT, uh, man, I, I I know we've done a little bit. I, I, I that's an area where I think that singularly has the best opportunity to transform the way that we do awareness. And I think that the more people we teach OSINT to, the less problems we'll have. I mean, in the short run, probably more problems, and and uh, I'll take full blame for that. But in the yeah. long run, I, I, I think it'll a, be awesome. I got a problem with my kids, man. They're they're already hackers. Yeah, I might. Uh, yeah, man. The stories we could we should have a we should have a parenting show one time and just talk about the things that hey, have happened. You ready for a math question? Is it easy? Can I? I got. I only got ten fingers. Okay, ready. So yeah. this number has two hundreds, and the tens digit is nine more than the ones digit. Is this Common Core? Because I, I'm it lost. is. It is. This is actually second grade math question. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing I learned math back back in the day. My wife and I were reading this question to each other, and it took us a, a, a minute, a, at least a, a minute, to like think about it and think it through because we didn't learn on the this stupid Common Core. Well, math yeah, I thing. think that's an important thing, right? The way we learned is different than the way that we're right. teaching our kids today. So and- my my point of the story is, well, the answer is two hundred and ninety, right? Is the tens digit is a nine, which is nine more than the ones digit. But uh, so we talked about this, and then my son was finished up his math homework, and this was the last question. And I asked him this question, and he goes, 290. I'm like, did you hear mommy and daddy say that before? He's like, no, 290. He's kind of looking at me. I'm like, he's, he's such a hacker. He totally heard us, right? And so he's, he's like, no, I was busted. like, you know, I'm like, oh, how did you get the answer? He's like, well, I knew it was 200 and there's a nine and a zero. So it was 290. I'm like, you totally heard us. I'm like, you know what? I give you credit for that because hacking in with my kids, you get points for that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I've, there's, there's some of the same things. Um, since we're talking about hacking and, uh, and math and, uh, we talked about online stuff already, is it, and I really wish Jack was here today, chip and pin. It, it turns out that got defeated already, which, you know, that shocked the hell out of me. Um, it's but, interesting. Uh, it's interesting now going to the store because if your card doesn't have the chip, you can still swipe it. Yeah, well, it's chip and sign in most cases anyway. Yep. Um, and, and it does take longer. And I'm actually finding, oddly enough, you know, it's funny. We all laughed when the, the, the retail associations came out and said it adds two to six seconds per transaction. And that really pisses people off. And you're like, two to six seconds. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I've noticed it more than twice where it's like, okay, this is, is this gonna thing going to go anytime soon? And the cashiers are like, yeah, it, uh, it sucks, bro. Like, yeah, sorry, yeah the cashiers wait. are really frustrated with it. I get that yeah. too. But th- this is the thing I come back to back in the beginning. So we, we like to, to uh, mock the outdated Stripe technology for a uh, defeatable, uh, really cool technology that that doubled and tripled the price of reissuing the cards 
but didn't actually do anything for online fraud except for increase the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And now apparently can also be defeated. So now that we've committed billions of dollars to it, my question remains, I'm sorry, what problem do we solve? And, and, uh, you know, I just, I'm not saying that there wasn't a better solution or, or that we needed anything. My question was just more of a, are we putting ourselves into a situation where a year from now, another company is going to say, well, we had chip and pin and we were compliant and we still got popped and, and Congress is going to ask us to do something again, speaking of do something. So, uh, so Congress now is going to ban car hacking. Your take? Uh, yeah, that's just bogus. Um, I wanted to talk about finding the needle. So the, the article is to find the needle, chop down the haystack, five steps for effective threat monitoring. I, 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 this article could have been much better than it was <laughs> written, uh, to put it lightly. Uh, the author talks about uh, consider your environment to be a contested space, proper remote access, dealing with elevated privileges, uh, looking at traffic, and learning from successful events not really my top five on threat monitoring which we talked about in our previous segment in any case yeah you know um i've heard other people talk about trying to find the needle in the needle stack which i think is probably more uh, apropos to to the situation that we take yeah. a look at yeah so i don't know i don't have much more to say about that article other than listen to our previous segment i think for our take on that yeah which which also goes to say that we are at a place where we have a lot of opinions and we say, well, I know what's right. And we throw it in there. And part of what our challenge then is, how do you make the time in a compressed environment with never ending pressures to figure out, does that work for me? Do I agree with it? Why or why not? Was that person qualified to explain it? Why or why not? D does this apply to my environment and, and what can I take away from it? It's, uh, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm, uh, those are just kind of the questions that I take a look at. So I want to talk about IoT security or insecurity. Yeah, please. We Let's... have to talk about that every, on every show. It's a requirement now. The German government has said that it's going to come out with standards for so hopeless routers, as the, the registered so eloquently puts it in their titles. But basically, they, uh, this German, uh, Berlin's Ministry of the Interior IT Security Office says it wants to test routers for support of security features like WPS encryption, brute force password protection, and the like. They wrote a document about how poorly secured routers can lead to mass compromise, and they want to come up with a standard for implementation. What is your take on the government, in this case Germany, coming up with a standard for securing routers or a standard for what means it means to be a secure router. We've talked about this a lot. I've learned a lot from you and the other guests that we've had on the program. The first thing it tells me is that we we've, we've done a poor job of impressing upon our colleagues and the people who rely on us for information and the people who create these, that there's a better way to be able to do it. And if we're getting to the place where, that breakdown is so severe that, that any government feels that they need to step in to legislate it. Um, th that's sad. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to look at it and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I've been asking for for years. Yeah. All I ask you to do then is go look at any other regulation that you've seen put in place and tell me if that worked out how you expected it to. Mm -hmm. And then go show me all the places people hide and ask me all the ways they get around it. And let's not point out, you know, VW and, um, you know, other other things related to uh, cheating and, and getting around it and whatever. You know, what what I did like was that they, they said, hey, we're going to have a scoreboard and some stuff's yeah. going to be essential and some stuff's not. Yeah, but see, I, I'm okay with that. Now, does the government <laughs> am, need to be able I to am, do it? I am, but I bet you most routers on the market today wouldn't would fail miserably on their tests because they talk about um, – Cross-site request forgery, integrity of guest networks, and defenses against certain attacks. I, and those are the things that we talk fail. about yeah. almost every week, right? Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's um, you know, it's it's. I, but this is so. Here's the positive I see in it: is there an opportunity? Is there a need for somebody to come and create a set of standards that has enough authority and weight to say, "Hey, we're going to score you, and we're going to tell people what the score is." Yeah, that's kind of cool. 
Do they then have to go legislate it further? I don't know. I yeah, I think, you know what? Well, you know, just the fact that they're mulling watch, it and that we're talking about it. Did you watch the interview uh, with Mudge? I watched the first half of it. Okay, so in the second the half, he talks about Cyber UL, which is a project he's working on. I'll go back and watch that because you know yeah. that's something I'm, I'm deeply interested in. It, he it describes exactly this, that there's a certification similar to the way the UL certifies things for safety, right? That there's a Cyber UL that certifies things. Now, if we I think can, it's a great strategy. If we can seep that into the conscious of consumers yep. and say, well... You know, yep. you only want to buy a router that has a cyber UL rating of, or cyber UL certification because it's passed some kind of security test that makes sure that there's no ridiculously stupid holes. Now, the thing is, we talked about technology before in the previous segment, how it changes. And yeah, someone could push down a firmware update that would invalidate its certification. And that's a problem. In that, well, how yeah, we keep in mind, that, too, the way UL works is that there's a certification and then there's a registration. And and. I don't think most people realize the distinction. You can be UL, UL registered, which is not certified, mm -hmm. right? There's a. It just means that you're registered. Um, but hey, it, it's a, it's a step in the right direction. You know, I didn't throw it up as a story, but uh, SEC is going to start potentially using information around uh, cybersecurity and breaches as a reason to downgrade firms. I think it's great. You know, and and let me just make a quick comment because I saw a lot of people say, "Well, it's too little, too late." No. And no. Nope. And, and I looked at their questions. They're starting with 16 questions. I can't remember any of them off the top of my head. In fact, I wouldn't do them justice to try to rip them off. But I didn't look at anything and say, well, that's stupid. I looked and went, those are actually reasonable questions. Here's the thing that, that people don't like so much about this is that we, we seem to want to distill security down to a checklist. So you and I just got done, right? We've now three, four times tonight talked about the fact that you can't make security a checklist. Security is a process. It's a mindset. And, and depending on your context, your environment, what's important to you, the, the threat actors that might be coming after you and any number of other things – you have to make those types of decisions and those t those determinations. So what I liked about what I saw with the SEC was it was kind of asking questions to say, we're going to assess the impact of these different things. We're going to assess your readiness for these types of things. And I think that's great. Now, where it's tough, and maybe and you know, I'm realizing something, maybe what's the, the problem is there's so much misunderstanding around security that we have executives and we have directors that say, but what's the answer? I need a yes or no. And when we say, well, it's complicated, they don't like that. They, mm. they want a, a, a better sense of assurance with it. Great. So then that gives us an area to work on. But what we're starting to see now is insurance companies getting into the game. In fact, there is a story I put up on that. It's not really exciting um, except for it says insurance companies are getting into it. And they're saying it's not about prevention. It's about detection and response. Yep. Not, not a surprise there. Uh, now the SEC is in on it. We're seeing a cyber UL on it. We're seeing other people take a, uh, take a stab at it. The governments are starting to foray into it. I'm always nervous when the governments do it just, just because that gets codified into law. And as we've seen with some of the laws that we have on the books now, they, they get twisted. Uh, they take a long time to change. And, and the reason I always ask the question, what's the problem we're trying to solve, is because if we can't articulate the problem, then whatever solution we put in place is probably going to be somewhat unwieldy. Mike, what's your assessment of the security of athletic achievement accumulating wearables? Isn't that an awesome term? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start using that all Isn't the time that awesome? now. Athletic you know, achievement accumulating wearables. I, that's that's look, a cool I, term. I like that term. I think it's the same thing that, that you and I look at all the time. Did anybody look at it and say, well, what if somebody breaks into this? What, what could they do? How could they do it? No. We looked at it as what what cool stuff could I do with this technology and does that improve health outcomes? Does that make people – can we gamify getting in shape? Can you compete against your buddies? Can you meet other people that are like you when you're out on the track? And of course, somebody then looked at it and went, I wonder what I can do with it. So what if I told you someone created Fitbit malware uh, injection method and can inject wouldn't malware? You, wouldn't even be remotely surprised by it. So they did. Um, See, not even remotely surprised. It is not, unclear. Not really I read your headline. Yeah, and well, it's unclear as to whether or not this malware in your Fitbit can infect your PC, which would be interesting. Um, but there is now like, malware for Fitbit. So I, I'm, I'm immune, I'm pretty sure, because I use a Mac. Yes, Macs don't get viruses. Remember that. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. The article's in the show notes, and uh, it links to the darknet.org.uk, uh, who also links to a, a YouTube video posted by 
who I believe is the malware author uh, and researcher in this uh, in this case. So I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, look, I, 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 I think I've started working on a concept that maybe I've talked about it here before, minimum viable security. I don't want it to be a checklist. I want it to be a mindset. I want it to be a framework. I've started working with smart, uh, startups and small businesses. This is why I come back and I ask you questions. Paul, I'm going to have to pull you into it. I'm not really ready to go too forward with it, but it, but I'm, I'm shaping it. And it's, I think we, we have to start learning how to ask minimum questions, right? Questions. It's mindset at the outset of these things so that a, a company can spend an hour, no more than a day, and they can ask basic stuff, basic threat model, basic understanding. But, he, and here's the big caveat it's then that container in which they operate. Mm-hmm. They right. They're creating their minimum viable product. I was just reading uh, Harvard. Uh, Harvard came out with a study. Somebody did a working paper, and they said, "How can I determine if a business is going to be viable or not?" And they said, "The best thing you can do is create your minimum viable product as fast as possible. Get it out there, evaluate, and that will tell us if it's successful or not." I couldn't agree more. You said earlier tonight we need to get faster with security. I couldn't agree more. Marry those two concepts together. In fact, flip it around, right? The idea that I got for minimum viable security came really simple. I was working with an organization that was they had a bunch of shadow IT, and they were tired of being told what to do. They were tired of security coming with these big, long checklists. So I met with them, and I said, well, you guys got inst- stuff to do. It's important, right? Yeah. You got budget you need to spend. It's important, right? Yeah. What if I could just give you the absolute minimum that you needed to do? And I used the word viable. I said, you, you need to be viable, but what if I could come in, instead of giving you a list, what if I just came in, I give you the absolute minimum that you needed to do to be viable for your stuff and to meet all your compliance regulations? I, it's not often that I would get hugged in a meeting, but it was the first time that I was like, no, no, I'm not a hugger. Like, we're, we're good. Uh, it, and, but so I started realizing, oh, wait, hold on. If I don't come in and say, here's your oppressive list of security things I need to see, hey, let me ask you three questions. Let me ask you five questions. And then what, what I have realized is that minimum viable security has two components. There's an internal component. What have you done to protect your company and your information? And then the flip side is, so, oh, you, you created an Internet of Things device. That's great, right? And what have I learned from you? So who created the firmware? Are you able to update the firmware? And what's the process to update the firmware? By the way, I've asked that of two startups, and they both looked at me and went, I I didn't even think about that. Mm-hmm. Right. But you need to. You know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the reasons I brought the story up, Mike, is because I was interviewing uh, Miko Hipponen. And uh, I was asking him about, and this is kind of where I was hoping you were going with this, is, you know, what's the threat against your organizations when it comes to mobile malware? And he said mobile malware is more about violating the individual's uh, privacy, violating the individual's device, and less about attacking the organization. So and far, th- and this is someone who's an expert so in, this, in this field. So far, yeah, so no, far that's what we've seen. Us, yeah. Frankly, right? Yeah, I mean, his his insights are pretty solid. Yeah, it's just, but so this is this is where we we're at that inflection point in our industry where we can say, okay, we can keep doing it the way we've done it dogmatically, and we can yell louder and pound our fists harder and just complain that nobody understands us, or uh, or we can flip it around. I mean, look, I, I th- there's two things I, I kind of want to point out. I saw a lot of backlash this week against insurance is, oh, companies are insuring. Well, it's because they hate security and they don't understand anyway. Well, need I remind anybody, insurance, proper insurance, right? High impact, low likelihood, fantastic opportunity to mitigate against risk. It's a it's a time vaunted strategy. It works great. Now if you're using it for escapism, sure I agree with everybody, but I don't I don't get all the hate on insurance, uh, especially if that's going to backstop you on stuff, because follow where that leads. We're going to start collecting the data we need. We're going to codify the things that work, and we're going to actually start to force change, whether you like it or not. I think that's a great thing, and I think it should be celebrated and supported. But then the flip side to it, too, and I I tried to go into this before, but I'm going to be really blunt on it. Did the stunt hacking work the way we expected it to, or is the stunt hacking what created the fact that now the government said, well, we got to do something. Let's shut them down and prevent them from doing it. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a a little of both, Mike. Um, yeah. On that note, unfortunately, we have to end the show because we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that next week, Mike. How's that? <laughs> I can't wait. I look forward to it. Excellent. I mean, I, look, I, I, I'm outspoken on some of these things. I just, um, I, I think our opportunity is to, th- to start to shift how we lead and how we communicate. I think that'll get us to the places that we want to be. 
And I think we got lots of opportunities to do it. Under the 10-year leadership of Paul, we'll get there a little faster. I don't know about that. But I do know that, as sad as it is, we have to end this episode of Security Weekly. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And, of course, we'll see everyone next week. Thanks for watching. Over and out. <laughs>